Yes, yes. Um, maybe not, but mm -hmm. so uh, anyway, let us start. And uh, so, uh, so uh, only a few words I want to say in the beginning. I want to say, well, uh, this it will be some kind of combination of conference or school, maybe. It means that we have four speakers and uh, no, uh, first of all, uh, these speakers are uh, very uh, uh, excellent people and it is one kind of uh, story. And second, they, they have enough time Talk what they want, but a general story is uh, well, vertex separator algebra, tensor categories, surely uh, 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 related uh, questions. And well, I hope that uh, so they have time really to move uh, relatively slowly and in the end go reach the new things and. Uh, so I, it, it can be very interesting for all people, for beginners and for non-beginners and for all of us. So and I think it is enough and we can start. And first speaker is Thomas Kreuzig. Oh, Thomas. Yeah, Boris, uh, you, you were gone. For, uh, I, I didn't hear anything. Um, can I start? You can, you can. OK, good. Uh, thank you, Boris, for the introduction. And thank you both for inviting me to this uh, school. Um, yeah, so Andy and I, we, we combine our lectures because we believe we have quite a few things about W algebras to, um, to explain. Um, first of all, if you have any questions, I have the chat function running on my monitor. So if you just type the question in the, in the chat, then I see it immediately. Okay, so uh, I, uh, this lecture, I will uh, start with, um, with W algebra and VOA basics, but eventually um, we will get to interesting results of Andy and myself. So the, the outline is, uh, I try to, uh, the, the plan is to cover the first two points this lecture. And then um, on, on Wednesday, I will come to uh, main uh, important theorems of the theory of W algebras. And what I'm really interested in today is uh, what I call quasi classical limits of W algebras. So where W algebras somehow become much simpler. This, this will be the aim of today's talk. Okay, before, um, I start with W algebras. I want to lose a few words on, on the historic use of vertex algebras. So VOA stands for vertex operator algebra. And um, they came up in the 70s, 80s. Uh, firstly, because um, a vertex algebra is the uh, rigorous mathematical or a rigorous mathematical formulation of the chiral algebra of a two dimensional conformal field theory. And such a conformal field theory describes the world sheet quantum field theory of a string. So it is a, a key object in string theory. And, um, and roughly speaking, uh, for physics, uh, what for a physicist is understanding a conformal field theory is for a mathematic, mathematician understanding the representation theory of VOA value well. So a conformal field theory especially is a very special representation of uh, actually two two copies of a VOA. 
<clears throat> now, for, for, uh, for a mathematician, VOAs became uh, important also in the 80s. Um, most, uh, um, most popular is uh, the result by Borchardt, who realized that a very special vertex algebra uh, has an action of this largest sporadic group, the monster group. And uh, then he was able to show that a certain uh, cohomology that the physicist calls the, uh, the Lie algebra of physical states, uh, um, but also carries a monster action and has uh, its uh, denominator has certain automorphic properties that prove this monster's moonshine conjecture. So this is a conjecture that relates um, uh, um, and, um, yeah, the, the monster group uh, uh, and, um, to, to help models um, on the upper half plane. Okay, and uh, then um, from, from the representation theory part, point of view, um, vertex algebras, uh, their representation categories provide modular tensor categories. And this is what you will hear about in Victor Ostrich's uh, talk. And uh, this is extremely interesting. However, historically, uh, people have really been interested in what's called a modular tensor category. So this is in uh, many respects, the simplest type of a braided tensor category. And nowadays we are interested in much more, much, much richer, I'd say, uh, the tensor categories. And uh, maybe I can say something on that on Wednesday. And uh, then there are various many interesting connections to geometry, topolo topology, representation theory, and so on. Now, uh, very recently, and by recently, I maybe mean the last 10, 20 years, so, or it's a matter of what you mean by recent, um, there have been many correspondences in physics between two-dimensional physics and three-dimensional physics or four-dimensional physics, where two-dimensional always, all, always, or, um, almost always means um, uh, that, that a vertex algebra or representations of a vertex algebra appear. And, uh, and so, um, for example, vertex algebras appeared as, uh, or their representations appeared as meaningful invariants of three and four manifolds. And uh, really the VOAs that are appearing are W algebras. And, uh, and even more uh, larger structures. Uh, I, I think Andy will say a few things about it. And, um, and, and these W algebras, they are very different from the ones that people have studied in the 80s and 90s. They, their representation theory is uh, much more complicated. And uh, is in, in any case, uh, many also new phenomena are predicted and this uh, requires new technology that needs to be developed. And what Andy and I are mainly focused on is, so in, in this uh, context of the 2D, 4D uh, correspondence, physicists uh, um, conjectured an, uh, a very surprising zoo of trialities. This means isomorphisms between seemingly very, very different W algebras. And, um, and, and, and we, we are trying to develop technology to, to actually prove these uh, isomorphisms and, and we actually do. So you, you, this is the main aim of our lecture series. And uh, so I, I think uh, yeah, for, for me, the set of lectures is uh, super nice. So do pay, he will uh, tell you quite a bit about these um, correspondences uh, to, to higher dimensional physics. And uh, maybe I can also say a little bit about it, or maybe you ask me questions about it and then I can say something. But um, for this lecture, I will now start with really with basics. So uh, I did define um, a vertex algebra in a moment, but um, for um, and, and the current uh, state of the art is that vertex algebra theory is very much Lie theory. Namely, one has a basic type of vertex algebra that is associated to a finite, uh, to an affine, or, uh, to an affine Lie super algebra with an invariant bilinear form. And this is called the affine vertex super algebra. I will define this in a moment. And uh, then it, it turns out that all known vertex algebras can be constructed by an uh, iteration of standard construction from these uh, affine vertex super algebras. And so especially the W algebras that I will introduce this lecture um, are realized as certain uh, semi-infinite cohomologies 
related to, uh, to this affine vertex super algebras. And uh, Andy then will also talk about other constructions called Orbifold and Corset. And again, it will turn out that this, uh, this uh, W algebras play a central role. Okay. Uh, so uh, th this means the logic of our lectures will be we will first in introduce um, the, uh, yeah, the, the affine vertex algebras and then come to the W algebras. And I don't want to overload uh, notation. So I will mostly state uh, statements for, for the Lie algebra case, but uh, the Lie super algebra case um, only amounts to adding the, the parity at appropriate places. Okay, so let's start with the lecture. Uh, first of all, I have to tell you what a vertex algebra is and the Definition already always takes a little bit of space. So in the very first place, it's a vector space. Usually we take it over the complex number, but um, you can also take any other field if you like. And actually you can also take any commutative ring. So you, you'll see uh, later when actually already at the end of my uh, lecture that uh, it turns out to be useful to uh, think about vertex algebras over certain commutative rings. And this then becomes very very important in, in Andy's lectures. So it's a, it's a, it's a vector, a C vector space for the moment. It's a, almost always an infinite dimensional uh, vector space. It has a, a very special vector that we call the vacuum. The physics uh, notation is this cat zero. And I will probably mostly use this bold face one to, uh, to uh, indicate it. It's a, uh, it's, it's some kind of highest weight vector. And then it has a linear operator called translation operator. And this is a V here. Uh, and, uh, and then a very important uh, state field correspondence that is a linear operation that here is denoted by this uh, Y of uh, V comma Z. So it associates to every element in this vector space a field. This means a formal power series in Z and Z inverse. Z is a formal variable. And the coefficients, they act on this vector space. They are linear operators on the vector space. So this means uh, to each uh, field you can associate such a, uh, to, to, each, uh, to each vector you can associate such a formal power series. And these are called the vertex operators and hence the name vertex operator algebra. Okay. And uh, then uh, this data is subject to a few axioms. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the field associated to this very special vector, to the vacuum vector, is just the identity. And then you have a state field correspondence. This means if you take a vector V in your vector space in your vertex algebra, you take the associated v, the field, you let, let it act on this vacuum vector. Well, then this is a, a formal power series in uh, in, in Z and Z inverse, where the coefficients are elements of your vector space V. And uh, actually it uh, turns out to be a formal power of uh, series in Z, so, so that the specialization Z equals zero, Z to zero makes sense. And this constant term is the vector itself uh, that you started with. So this is called the state field correspondence. And uh, uh, you, you see it's a nice correspondence because you can start with an element in the vertex algebra, you get a field. If you have a field, you can just by acting on the vacuum and get, uh, extracting the constant coefficient, you get the original vectors, vector back. Then the uh, translation axiom is that the translation operator acts as a derivative on the fields. And the most important um, uh, axiom is locality. So it, uh, and what does a locality mean? It uh, means this one. So this means that two fields A and B are called local if they, you can think about it as almost commute. This means you can take the, uh, the field A at, at Z at the formal variable Z, B at the formal variable W. You take A times B minus B times A. And uh, this is not uh, zero. This is a, a formal power series, uh, but if you, um, multiplied with a Z minus W to a sufficient high power, um, then this becomes a zero. And uh, 
So the, and why is this called a locality? So you, uh, you, you should think about it as um, A and B, they commute with each other, except if they are at, uh, at uh, coinciding points. Well, for example, um, what kind of uh, formal power series have the property that uh, if they multiply them with a Z minus W to some appropriate power, you get zero. These are exactly uh, formal delta distributions and their derivatives. So, and then, and, yeah. Okay, and uh, this locality is, uh, um, well, it's the most uh, important axiom for vertex algebras and it especially implies that um, uh, the, the, the product of two fields, uh, I mean, they allow for what is called an operator product expansion. This, this means uh, the, the product of these two fields, the operator, operator product is a, uh, is, a, is a Laurent series in Z minus W where the coefficients are fields in the second variable. And uh, one, uh, and then uh, the constant coefficient that appears in in this uh, operator product expansion, I should have written here W, but that doesn't matter. Let's uh, just um, so um, I mean, um, so the, the constant uh, term uh, the, the, the term that comes with uh, z minus w to the zero is called the normal ordered product. So this is an uh, will be an important for the next slide slides. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the definition of vertex algebras. I, um, I, I, I'm probably the audience is quite mixed and probably I'm boring quite a few of you with the uh, definition. So let me um, go on. Uh, we need um, the, uh, the notion of generating uh, fields. So if we have a vertex algebra, then we can take a, consider a subset of the set of fields. So here, yeah, I is just some index set. And uh, then such a set, we say, uh, weakly generates the vertex algebra. Um, if uh, um, if uh, every uh, element of a V is a, is a word and iterated, uh, I mean, in, in iterate uh, uh, products of these, these uh, uh, fields in the set. So this, we say it, it weakly generates uh, the vertex algebra, it generates the vertex algebra under operator product. Um, this, this is a good notion, but actually the, the more important notion is the one of strong generations. And so uh, this is why I introduced this normal order product. Product. A vertex algebra is strongly generated by the set of fields. If every field can be written as a normally ordered polynomial of these uh, fields in the set and their iterated derivatives, and uh, this is very closely related to the notion of a basis. Namely, whenever you have a, um, a strong um, generating uh, set, then um, the um, that this 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 means the uh, the the uh, associated vectors to this uh, strong generated sets and their derivatives, they form a, um, a a generating set of the vertex algebra as a vector space, and uh, if it is a uh, uh, and we say if this generating set is a basis a poincare birkhoff wit basis, then uh, we say the vertex algebra actually even freely generates it, and. Uh, free generation means that there are no normally ordered uh, relations be uh, between fields. So of, of course, if we can take a, uh, um, a polynomial in this uh, in, in this uh, in these fields and their derivatives, it could be that a certain such polynomial acts as zero on V. Then we would have a relation. And when this is impossible to happen, this means, which is equivalent to that, these uh, this, these fields give rise to a basis, a Poincare Birkhoff width basis of the uh, view A, then we say the view A is freely generated. And uh, so, one major goal is if you have a vertex algebra, you'd like to understand what are the song generators, what are their relations. Okay. 
so this this uh, this next this slide here is um, more an outline what what more general can be done but for this lecture we will really be interested in basic um, VOA structure and not representation theory however there's also a notion of a module uh, for for vertex algebra this is again uh, a vector space a usually usually infinite uh, dimensional vector space and such that um, you have fields um, and again fields uh, associated to elements of your VOA that act on this uh, um, vector space and then even more general you have uh, uh, fields associated to these modules and these fields actually intertwine between different modules so they give rise to uh, to a tensor product on, on the set of modules and what is uh, very interesting and uh, important is by the action of the vertex algebra on modules is still local the, 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 the behavior of fields corresponding to modules of these intertwining operators is very much not local. So uh, this, uh, if, if you, um, I, I should have uh, said here in, in this slide that n is an integer. So here, uh, the, the powers in which uh, z minus w appears is integer. While, um, for for the uh, the for the operator products of intertwining operators, this does not need to be uh, integer. And so, especially whether you, you expand uh, uh, and depending on in which uh, region you expand uh, um, these these uh, operator product expansions, you get uh, different answers. And uh, so, you have non-trivial monodromy if you transport one field and on a, around another one. And this is very in interesting, and this is also very complicated to understand. But what it means is that um, yeah, this, this tensor product of two fields is not commutative, but only commutative up to isomorphism. And this is the, the heart why um, vertex algebras are so interesting, for example, for Victor Ostrich, who will talk about tensor categories, because um, 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 the, the representation categories of vertex algebras give rise to representation categories where the tensor product is as um, non-commutative as possible in a certain sense or as non-degenerate commutative as possible in a certain sense. And so they give rise to what is called very interesting braided tensor categories, but at, at least if the category is nice enough. Okay, so uh, the representation uh, or the categorical part of the representation theory of vertex algebra you, you will learn about in Victor Ostrich's talks, I think. Okay, now um, I, I continue with a few examples. So the first example you'll probably uh, learn about in every VOA lecture is the, uh, the Virasoro vertex algebra. I say here the universal Virasoro vertex algebra. As a, um, uh, as a graded vector space, it's just a polynomial ring in infinitely many variables that I call here L minus two, L minus three, L minus four, et cetera. And uh, this vertex algebra is um, freely and strongly generated by the Virasoro field. This is, um, the, this is uh, associated to them, the, the field associated to the monomial L minus two. It has um, this expansion and this, this, and uh, the operator product is, uh, or, or is of this type here. So it's a fourth order pole where a certain complex number here appears. This is called the central charge. And uh, yeah, and then it's on, on this form. And there's an, uh, an uh, identity that allows you how to, uh, to translate operator products into commutational relations of these coefficients. These coefficients are also usually often called modes. And uh, this is called the Virasoro vertex algebra because the commutation relations here, these are precisely the commutation relations of the Virasoro Lie algebra, where the central element of the Virasoro Lie algebra is replaced by the complex number C. Okay, so this is, um, um, and this, yeah. And um, uh, I have defined a vertex algebra and uh, Usually, people talk about vertex operator algebras. I don't want to distinguish between these too much, but um, 
Mm, what do we see here? We see here, first of all, this uh, vector space is uh, uh, naturally graded. So we would just give L minus two grade two, L minus three grade three, et cetera. And then every monomial, uh, the, the corresponding uh, degree. So it's actually with this grading, um, this we also, vertex algebra becomes an uh, Z graded or Z plus graded um, vector space. And it turns actually uh, out that it's uh, this grading is given by 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 the by the Virasovo zero mode, which is L by an L node. So, okay. And in, in general, a vertex operator algebra is usually defined to be a vertex algebra that has an additional Virasovo structure. It has a Virasovo subalgebra. So this means, especially the Virasovo algebra I just had given is an example of a vertex operator algebra. And moreover, one requires that it is uh, graded by non-negative integers by conformal weight. This means by eigenvalue of this uh, L naught. However, often one, one drops a few conditions. For example, uh, for us, it's uh, better if we uh, relax this to half integer graded, which is not a big difference. Um, in any case, I prefer to talk about vertex algebra. So for us, it's not necessarily important that we have a Virasovo element. Okay. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat function and then I see them immediately. Then, um, while historically uh, people have uh, used uh, the operator product expansion, but it comes from physics. It, it turns out that especially the community around Victor, uh, Victor Katz and Alberto de Sol, they, they like to use the lambda bracket instead. And so I, I just mentioned this here. Um, whenever we have a field, so I call it here A of Z with expansion A and Z to the minus N minus one, then the lambda bracket is uh, defined to be the, um, formal power series uh, in lambda, where the co coefficients are given by the action of this a n on the given vector b. Or you can uh, also, and then you can also define it um, on a corresponding field by just uh, applying this, this state field correspondence to the lambda bracket of b. Okay. And uh, so, this notion is totally equivalent to OPE. It's, uh, it's maybe a little bit more convenient because instead of keeping a track of the Z minus Ws, you essentially replace them by a lambda. Anyway, uh, it, uh, I, I will sometimes uh, phrase formulas in terms of those lambda brackets, but all you have to know is that this is equivalent to the OPE notion. Okay, I will now talk about strongly and freely generated vertex algebras. So this means they have a certain set of fields that uh, strongly generate the vertex algebra. This means every field is normally ordered polynomial in the strong generators and their iterated derivatives. And, um, and they are freely generated in the sense that there are no relations between these fields. So there are no normally ordered relations. And there are um, four classes of those uh, which we are interested in. It's uh, one class that is very easy. And uh, of course, uh, the drawback is if, if something is easy, it's probably not too exciting. So we have to discuss that. And, and then the rest is what we are interested in, in it. And the hierarchy goes, uh, we first, first in, introduce vertex algebras associated to these super algebras. Then from those, we get the W algebras. And then eventually, we'd like, we would like to find unifying structures. So I should call them Alinsho algebras just because Andy is the first one who um, understood the existence of such a structure. And that is uh, important in under, un understanding these uh, deep new problems that arise in, 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 in higher dimensional, uh, in relation to higher dimensional physics, geometry, and topology. Okay, so I start with the easiest one. 
äh, Free Field Algebra. So Free Field Algebra is um, a vertex algebra that has a certain strong generating set. And these uh, strong generators behave very simply in the sense that in uh, on the OPE, the um, only the vacuum appears, only a multiple of the identity field appears. So then no, no non-trivial uh, field appears in the OPE. And uh, th this, this, is, uh, this is almost as simple as a vertex algebra can be. But uh, the, the pole order uh, in, with which it appears can be an um, arbitrary, um, and can be an arbitrary uh, integer. And uh, it can be a vertex algebra or a vertex super algebra. So, okay. We introduced this notion in our recent paper on triality, and there we uh, used the word generalized. I've learned that uh, one should avoid the word generalized as much as possible. And so we try. We, we decided to, to use uh, these lectures to uh, remove the word generalized. After all, these are all equally good uh, free field algebras. And um, uh, and and uh, our we we use the word generalized because it uh, uh, generalized the notion of uh, standard free field algebras. So the standard free field algebras, two of those I will mention in a, in a minute, are the free boson, free fermion, symplectic boson, and symplectic fermion. So it turns out if these, uh, in the definition of a free field algebra here, the poles of a certain order appear. And uh, if this uh, order for all uh, fields is uh, a pole of order two, and all fields are even, then this is nothing but the free boson or Heisenberg vertex algebra of rank the cardinality of the set I. If um, uh, V is a, 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 a purely odd, uh, is, 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 uh, is odd in the sense that all generators are odd, are fermionic, and they have a weight one, which means that um, um, uh, which, which again means that uh, only poles of order two appear in this OPE of the strong generators, then this algebra is called the symplectic fermion algebra, super algebra. And this is actually, uh, these two are actually the first examples of uh, affine vertex super algebra because the Heisenberg vertex algebra is the vertex algebra of the affine, of, of the Lie algebra GL1. Uh, and a certain amount of copies of a GL1. And the symplectic fermions is the affine vertex super algebra of PSL1 slash one. So that is a, just a super commutative super algebra. And then if only a, a poles of order one appear, then this vertex algebra is called the symplectic bosons, if it's a even and a free fermions, if it's odd. And in the symplectic case, in the symplectic fermion, symplectic boson ca case, only, uh, only pairs of um, fields can appear if you want this bilinear form to be non-degenerate. And uh, these four examples are the only free field algebras that have a Virasso subalgebra. If you have higher order poles, these free field algebras will only be um, vertex algebras, but not vertex super algebras. In any case, let's remember this a free field algebra is a vertex algebra where the OPE has this very simple form, namely um, that in the OPE, only a constant times Z minus W to some power appears, nothing else. Okay. So for example, the rank one examples uh, are uh, the free fermion and free bosons, so the free and the free boson, uh, uh, I mean, and, and, and the higher rank, uh, I'm, um, and, and their generalization. So the underlying um, vector space is just the polynomial ring in infinitely many variables that I denote by x minus r, x minus r minus one, etc. So this means that x minus r has uh, weight r. And so this has a homogeneous, obvious homogeneous basis of given weight here. And uh, this uh, 
Wallace algebra is strongly and freely generated by a single field, namely the field uh, associated to the vector x minus r, and the OPE is nothing but uh, a pole of order 2r. And if r is equal to 1, then this is the three boson or Heisenberg vertex algebra. Um, so this is the probably the best known vertex algebra overall. And uh, similarly, uh, if we take a, a vert corresponding vertex super algebra, we can also take R to be a positive, but now we prefer to be a half integer. Now again, we take a polynomials in infinitely many uh, uh, variables, but now we want them to be odd. This means every such variable squares to zero. Or you can say V is the exterior algebra in infinitely many uh, variables. And then again, uh, the, the field corresponding to the, to the first non-trivial vector to psi minus r um, and generates this vertex algebra freely and strongly. And again, it just has a pole of order 2r. Now, note that now 2r is an odd integer in this case. And the very first case, r equals one half, is the very well known free fermion vertex super algebra. Okay, so um, there's not much to say about this uh, uh, super algebra site. We, we have immediately stated a nice uh, PBW basis, and this is just given. Uh, this vertex algebras are just, um, yeah, I mean, generated by these monomials, uh, have a simple OPE. Yeah, not much to say about it, but. Um, the interesting thing that comes uh, from, from, from what we will learn is that much more complicated um, vertex algebras, understanding structural results about them can be reduced to problems on free field algebras. So this will be the theme. This is why I spent time on introducing free field algebras because uh, we, uh, in, in many, with many interesting uh, questions, you, um, you can reduce these questions to, uh, questions to actually still complicated free field algebra questions. Okay, very good. Um, now I finally uh, define an uh, affine Lee super algebra. So you get take a Lee super algebra G, um, you have a bilinear form on it that is uh, super symmetric and invariant, and we also require it to be non degenerate. If you drop the non-degeneracy, you will just get a, a, the, the corresponding vertex algebra will have a center. Um, then we take the um, uh, affinization. So this means uh, we uh, take long polynomials with coefficients in G, uh, extend by a central element that we denote by K and a derivation that uh, we denote by D. Uh, commutation relations are then immediately given by the ones of the Lie algebra where the central term also appears in this form. Then um, if, um, one calls the, the, uh, the uh, when one defines the horizontal subalgebra to be just the least subalgebra together with the central element and the derivation, call this ho the horizontal subalgebra or the, uh, the zero mode subalgebra if you want. Anyway, then we have a positive part and a negative part. Uh, we need to introduce this because uh, now remember what's the data of a vertex algebra where well, it's an infinite dimensional vector space satisfying certain properties. So we have to define this ve vector space. And so what do we do? We take here a one dimensional representation, which we denote by CK. And that is nothing but the trivial representation for G. We also uh, let a, uh, um, um, the derivation act trivially, and uh, the k in, in, uh, uh, indicates that this uh, central element acts by the scalar k. So, and on this um, one dimensional representation, we can lift to a module for the positive algebra by just uh, letting everything else uh, act as zero. And then we uh, can let the negative part act freely. And then the corresponding object is uh, a module. For the affine Lie super algebra, it's called the vacuum uh, Werner module. 
and uh, it uh, can be given the structure I mean, vacuum Werner module at level k, and it can be given uh, a structure of the vertex algebra. So we see as a as a vector space, this is nothing but um, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 polynomial rank in in the in this negative uh, subalgebra. And the, but anyway, the important thing is that it can be given the structure of a vertex algebra. This vertex algebra is called the universal FNBOA of G at level K. And the important thing is why it's uh, an infinite dimensional vector space. Uh, it uh, is uh, strongly finite uh, uh, generated by fields that we, I call it JX, where X runs over a basis of the Lie algebra. So that's a finite set. And the OPEs have a very simple form. They have a first over order pole where the field associated to the commutator of X and Y appears, and a second order pole that, that is nothing but this scalar K, the level times the inner product of X and Y. Now, often one is then interest, interested in the simple quotient of this one. Um, we will not go come to this this lecture, but it will be denoted by LKG, especially if. Um, the k is a positive integer, one gets integrable representations, and then in physics, the corresponding conformal field theories are called westerminer witten theories. So I will then also, also denote this case by the westerminer witten case. Okay. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that uh, the uh, one can uh, come from, uh, go uh, from the operator product to the commutation relations. And so the commutation relations um, um, of the uh, FIB algebra are completely encoded in the simple operator product expansion. Okay, very good. Now I say this is a vertex operator algebra because it always contains a Viasso element that's called, it's called the Sukabara element. Well, and if I, I mean, I always, I mean, except if I hear this K plus H check is at zero. Um, so here H check is the sim symbol for the dual Coxeter number. Um, the, the scalar uh, with which the central element of the Viasso algebra acts is given in terms of the dimension, the super dimension of G, K and H check. We have this formula and um, yeah, uh, one very interesting case is, uh, of, uh, as you can see from the formula, if k plus h check is equal to zero, because then this element doesn't exist. And what happens in this case is that then uh, you still have this uh, uh, sum over this x psi x psi prime. And uh, this still will be a field of the vertex algebra, but it will actually be a field that commutes with every other field. And so it turns out in those cases, the vertex algebra has a large center. And this large center actually relates to, to classical things. Namely, one can also take the, the, the this, uh, central element to be very large, you can let it go to infinity. This is what we call a classical or quasi-classical limit. And in that case, also the vertex algebra uh, will have a large center. And these are related, and um, these relations are, well, they, they connect uh, very nicely to the classical geometric Langmans correspondence. And, um, and, and, and I will actually discuss these large level limits quite a bit this lecture. Okay. Very good. Um, now, whenever, one gives a definition, maybe an example is not bad. So the simplest non-commutative the algebra that comes in mind is SL2. I denote the standard generators by EHF and I note this in later uh, slides, I, 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 I change H to X. Anyway, they, have, uh, they satisfy here these standard commutation relations and the bilinear form on, on this uh, on this basis elements is, is this one all others are zero whenever I I don't state a relation I don't state it because it's zero and then the affinization has uh, these commutation relations 
So you see the, all, you, all you add is you add these mode indices, which then add up, and then you also add the central element appearing whenever the corresponding bilinear form is non-zero. So it's, an, yeah. And here I recall uh, the commutation relations of the F and algebra. Now you, uh, you set the central element to equal to the scalar K. And then um, the affine vertex algebra is nothing but the polynomial ring in this uh, negative modes, the E minus one H minus one F minus one E minus two H minus two F minus two, et cetera. And the, cost, the, the, the field to, to corresponding to E minus one, we denote by E of Z and it is the, the sum E n z to the minus n minus n and minus one, similarly for H and F and the corresponding OPEs are of this nice form, which uh, completely encode these compute, uh, commutation relations. Okay, let me give one more example because I also mentioned super algebras and um, I think it's important also to become a little bit familiar with super algebras so it, it turns out these modern developments, uh, you can't really survive without working with super algebras as well. And the simplest, uh, the simplest non-trivial, these super algebras always be one, two. It's even subalgebra SL2. It is five dimensional. So the even part is three dimensional. The odd part is two dimensional. The odd part is just the two dimensional standard representation of SL2. We denote the uh, generators, uh, EHF for the SL2 subalgebra and X and Y for the odd part for the standard representation. So then the commutation relations are those of SL2 here in the first line. Then uh, SL2 X on X, Y, X and Y form carry the standard representation. And moreover, the, 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 the commutators, so here, or better said, the anti commutators of X and Y, they give you back elements in SL2. And then um, and the bilinear form uh, is, uh, is of, uh, of this type. So uh, OSP stands for orthosymplectic. And while you can think about, S of, uh, about SL2 as a traceless um, two by two matrices, you can uh, think about OSP12 about, uh, as uh, orthosymplectic one slash two supermatrices. So there's a certain symplectic or orthosymplectic form that defines this, the superalgebra. Um, then if you pass to the vertex algebra where you go to the affinization, you set the central element to be your favorite scalar and then you define fields as before. And just for completeness, I now list the complete uh, commutation relations. Um, The details are not so important. I list them because I now want to discuss classical limits. So we want to ask the question, what happens if I take this uh, scalar to be large I and mean, if I send it to infinity? What can we do? First of all, we take a K to be finite and we define uh, X tilde to be uh, one over K X. And then I just, uh, and, I, and then, then I set epsilon to be one over K. So we want to be a K to be large. So we want epsilon to be small. And now I just uh, uh, replace uh, X everywhere by X tilde and uh, modify accordingly by epsilon. And so, and if you do this, this is a very, very simple exercise. You, you write down the OPEs and you see, um, you, you see that the uh, that uh, every term in the OPE comes with an epsilon. And I'm sorry, this is somehow a typo. This is also an epsilon. Right. So we just see that on the right-hand side of the OPE, we have epsilons everywhere. And so this means uh, if I take the large level limit, that means epsilon to zero, all these terms in the OPE uh, disappear this means in the large level limit, the whole vertex algebra just becomes a huge commutative algebra. Right. So, and uh, what I present here has nothing to do with OSP 1, 2. This works 
equally well for any affine superalgebra. You just do uh, the, the rescaling in this way. Um, then the OPEs uh, on the right hand side become linear and epsilon. Uh, and with, I mean, and no, no, I mean, no constant term in epsilon. So especially if you set epsilon to zero, complete OPEs vanish. So affine vertex algebras always allow for a large level that limit in which the vertex algebra becomes commutative. Okay. Now, now I ask whether we can do better, or actually I shouldn't say better, whether we can do differently. So I, in some, some sense, I would like to rescale less brutal. Right here, I rescale by one over k. So let's do half of that. Let's do rescaling by one over square root of k. Then um, uh, I can again um, write down the OPEs, but now, Remember the OPE of E and F uh, has a term of type K times Z minus W. So here now I divide uh, E and F both by one over square root of K. So this means this second order pole uh, becomes a constant one times Z minus W to the minus two. While uh, this linear term here still has an epsilon. Right. So we still see we have many epsilons and so we still see if, uh, and actually what, what do we see here? If we set epsilon to zero, then only, only the second order poles survive. And so it uh, turns out in this, uh, then uh, the fn vertex algebra becomes a free field algebra. Right? It becomes a pair of symplectic fermions and a rank together with a three, rank three Heisenberg algebra. So, so what we learn from this is that uh, very much, uh, so what, what, what's the picture? We defined this uh, fn vertex supra-algebra. It depends on a parameter k. This is a complex number. And we see actually we can uh, view the vertex algebra as a vertex algebra over polynomials in this, uh, in this variable. And so especially we can take a limit, this uh, number uh, to infinity. Now we, we did an, um, a slight rescaling to make things more interesting. And we observed depending on how we rescale, we either get a commutative algebra in the limit or a free field algebra. Okay. What happens if we mix the two? So we can, for example, um, um, we, we can, for example, rescale the even fields, the SL2 by one over K and the odd field simply by one over square root of K. We do the very same uh, procedure. So here the epsilon is here. And, and we see that again, we have many epsilons appearing. But then we have some terms that have a very nice OPE, very nice. So we, we see uh, if we take epsilon to zero, um, then actually all the even fields become commutative. The odd fields behave like a free field algebra, but, uh, uh, but also the, these, this commutative algebra appears in the OPE. So we can think about this limit as a free field limit. I mean, if a mix the limit, where the, the commutative subalgebra couples to this free field algebra in the sense that it appears also in the OPE of this free field. So they are not quite free fields, but a huge uh, central extension of the free field algebra. And then one can also scale a little bit more finely to, to get that um, the affine subalgebra becomes commutative and the odd uh, subalgebra becomes a free field algebra. And then there are actually many more possibilities. They are all interesting, um, and so as a summary, uh, I, I, uh, I state that we have, depending on how we scale our fields and then take this level to infinity, we either get a commutative algebra, a free field algebra, or something that is mixed. Okay. Now, I want to spend the remaining time uh, to uh, in order to claim that something similar 
happens for W algebras. So first of all, I will now finally define W algebras. That already takes a little bit of time. And before I do so, I should say um, the, um, the, the theory of W algebras goes back to Boris and Edward Frankel and Katz and Wakimoto and also Rowan and um, also many others, but uh, I, I only use results of these, actually I only use results of Fagan, Frankel, Katz and Wakimoto in my presentation. And then for the modern, more modern perspective also Tomiyuki Arakawa is very important to mention. He uh, did a huge portion of the very recent development. So what do we want to do? I mean, if vertex algebras just stay with uh, FINE super algebras, that's fine, but it wouldn't be terribly exciting. So uh, we, we would like to use some kind of interesting construction to get more, let's say more sophisticated vertex algebras that uh, then maybe also have more chances to appear in interesting geometry, topology or physics, or whatever. So first we fix the least super algebra by linear form of basis. We denote the, uh, the, the multiplicities with, with which uh, basis vectors appear in the commutation relations by structure constants and denote them by F, alpha, beta, gamma here. We denote the, uh, this, the, the absolute value of alpha means the parity. Uh, so here, oh or minus one to the uh, absolute value is the parity. And uh, then to each basis vector, we associate a field and it has this OPE. So this is just recalling what we had. And if we take a lo lower index, then that's the, uh, then that, that, that's the basis vector with respect to a dual basis, dual with respect to this bilinear form. So here I just uh, recall the notion of Super algebra, I finally super algebra. Now it becomes uh, important. We choose a nil potent element in the Lie algebra. So, for example, if we take SL2 as our Lie algebra, then we take the F of the SL2 to be our nil potent element. Now, this SL2 uh, can, uh, I mean, this F can always be um, uh, extended to an SL2 triple by Jacobson Morozov theorem. I, I should have said F is even. Uh, satisfying standard relations. And uh, here I, I now denote the, what I denoted by H before I now denote by X. And uh, so X is the element of the Cartan subalgebra of the SL2. So especially it X uh, semi-simple on G. And so it gives us a, 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 a grading, a half integer grading by corresponding weight. So then we uh, denote by SK the uh, um, uh, a basis of the graded pieces. So that our original um, basis is the union of these uh, basis is uh, the subspaces and uh, denote plus and uh, in positive and negative part in the usual way. Now what's very important is uh, we use the near potent element F. So F is in G minus one. This means if I take the commutator of two elements in G one half, uh, that must be by uh, by a Jacobi identity um, in G1. So this means the, the, the inner product of F with the commutator of A and B might be non-zero. And so I did, we, we use this to define a bilinear form on G1 half. So F defines an, an additional bilinear form just on the subspace. Now one introduces many free field algebras so in the very first place, a free field algebra associated to the vector space G plus to, so the, to the subspace that is positively graded by this, um, SL, uh, by, by, by this X eigenvalue, this Cartan SL2. And, uh, and, and to each such basis vector, we associate a free field. And, uh, and to, e to each uh, of its dual uh, dual basis vector one as well. And uh, we associate it of reverse parity. So this means if uh, X alpha is an even element, then phi alpha is an odd field. And then uh, the G one half, the half integer graded piece gets a few additional fermions. So this is a, a subtlety that uh, maybe can be ignored for the moment. 
um, be, uh, it, it, it just it turns out whenever g one half the half integer graded piece is non-trivial, then the story becomes a tiny bit more complicated. In any case, what one does is uh, um, one introduces um, a, a complex that is just the affine VOA times a free field algebra associated to the positive part of G via this grading. So this means to every basis element of G plus, we have, a, we, we call it, a, let's call it a super fermion. That means a free field of reversed parity. And, and, and then uh, to every element of G one half, we have an additional free field actually of correct parity. So now parity reversal. If you want to work with these things, of course, the, the precise um, statements are important, but for the moment, um, the, the important thing is we take the affine word super algebra, we tensor it, uh, it with a large free field algebra that is determined by the uh, one half set grading that is determined by the, the chosen SL2 sub algebra. Now, I, I said this defines a complex because then there, it, it turns out, so this is what one now has to realize, there is this um, long uh, normally ordered polynomial in these um, fields of the FNBOA and the three fields of this form. Um, and uh, this, uh, so here maybe um, these, these two terms uh, define the standard um, uh, semi-infinite Lie algebra differential on the on the uh, upper half, important half and on the G plus uh, part of G, and then this 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 gives us an, a character. So it's a something like a standard differential with a character. Well, the important thing it's a di differential. This means um, uh, so this is an odd field because these always have reverse parity. The phi alpha has opposite phi parity to the x alpha. And if one looks at this carefully uh, and, and this and this, you also see they are all odd. And uh, it, it turns out uh, they have uh, this, this field commutes, anti-commutes with itself, which means that it's the zero mode, it is zero uh, squares to zero. So, so the zero mode of this field D is an odd element that squares to zero. And so this means we have the complex uh, consisting out of this affine vertex algebra times this huge field algebra, and then this differential, and that, and that defines as the W algebra. So the W algebra associated to the D super algebra G, the nilpotent, even nilpotent element F in G, and the complex number K is uh, the homology of this complex. Okay. So this, this uh, summarizes it. Now, uh, the basic examples, well, one new potent element one can always come up with is uh, F equals zero. Okay, uh, then, uh, then and we also include it, but then we don't do anything. Then the differential is zero. The free field uh, super algebra is trivial and we don't do any reduction. So the W algebra is just the F um, And then um, if we take uh, F to be principal new potent, then the W algebra is what, what is usually denoted by W algebra in the literature, or what is most often denoted by, we will then say it's the principal W algebra of G at level K. And in the, level, in the case of SL2, well, there is only non, one non-zero new potent element, that's the principal one. And the W algebra is the real solar algebra. Very good. <clears throat> now, um, so this is the definition. And now, now we would like to understand the structural results, right? We, we defined it at this homology. So um, it's a little bit hard to say, say what, what this W algebra is. I mean, we would now would like to ask questions. Okay, well, it, uh, is the, in which degree is, uh, is the homology non-trivial, and then uh, and um, 
what 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 kind type of generators does this W algebra have? Uh, and uh, and then you want to ask more questions. For example, you would you like to know is this W algebra a simple vertex algebra? Or does it have non-trivial ideals? Or we, we saw that the affine vertex algebra is a vertex algebra over polynomials in this K. Can we do something similar for the W algebra, etc.? So we would like to understand structure of this W algebra. So how do we start with this? Well, in the very first place, we write down fields that we kind of obviously get. The obvious is, of course, uh, um, uh, a matter of taste. Well, we have an affine sub-algebra that has the Virasoro field that is, uh, we call it the Sugawara Virasoro field. And then, um, um, and then the fermions have uh, actually a variety of choices of Virasoro field, but uh, there's a, a unique choice that makes this, uh, this uh, field D of Z, whose zero mode is the differential for our complex, uh, a field of conformal weight one. And uh, that is the linear combination of these fields. And uh, each term here uh, um, um, contributes uh, a sum to the central charge. So the Sugawara vector gives uh, the central charge of the affine vertex algebra, this derivative of the field associated to the Cartan subalgebra of SL2 gives this uh, shift by the level times x squared times 12, then uh, the, the uh, three fermions, I mean these ones, give rise to this term, and then the fermions associated to the dimension half on half fields give rise to this term. Precise form, not so important for the moment. All I want to say is um, if one uh, smartly uh, combines the Virasoro fields of all the subalgebras, then one gets a Virasoro field for the W algebra. Okay, um, now we would like to understand whether the W algebra has uh, uh, fields of conformal weight one. Well, the affine vertex algebra has fields of conformal weight one, which we denote by X alpha. Now we shift this by a certain bilinear in the fermions. That's what we denote by J alpha. And then we also shift by a bilinear in the neutral fermions and um, um, well, these are a priori only certain dimension one fields, conformal weight one fields in the complex. But um, this, this makes sense as we'll see in the next slide. First of all, um, uh, the, 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 the subspace of the Lie algebra we are interested in is the, the kernel of F. Um, the, this, this means uh, these are the lowest weight vectors with respect to the SL2 action. And um, especially we define A to be the sub Lie algebra that is the intersection of the grade zero piece with the um, kernel of F. So the sub algebra is actually uh, it is a, a, a direct sum of trivial, uh, trivial representations for the um, for the SL two determined by the new total element. In other words, A is the sub Lie algebra that commutes the sub Lie super algebra that commutes with the action of the SL2, uh, of the SL2 for the reduction. Okay. So it commutes with this SL2, and so this, this kind of indicates that it should have a chance to survive the homology. And indeed, a uh, the theorem is that uh, in the very first place, um, they, they are in the kernel, and actually they give rise to non-trivial classes in homology, these, these, these fields I, if uh, I alpha corresponds to an element in the sub D super algebra A. So their OPE is uh, the OPE of the affine sub algebra of type A, where, where the level is determined by this relative complicated formula. It is just uh, the ordinary shift level shifted by a multiple of the, uh, of, of the dual coxeter number, the dual coxeter number of G naught. And then here there is this additional com contribution from the rate one half, uh, from, from the uh, one half graded piece. Okay, so in, in, in the very first place in affine vertex algebra, um, 
if, if we have an SL2 embedding such, such that this SL2 commutes with a certain subalgebra, then an affine subalgebra of this type survives the reduction. And more generally, the basic structural result, I uh, added it here relatively completely due to cuts and Wakimoto is the following. It, it's this uh, statement. Um, so the most important, um, uh, let, let's maybe first go to this one. So we have a basis of the subspace of G that is invariant under the action of F that's in the kernel of F. This means this is the space of lowest weight vectors with respect to the SL2 action. And a basis of this space gives a basis of, uh, of the W algebra in the sense that the associated fields strongly and freely generate the vertex algebra. This means the, the, the W algebra. This means the W algebra has as many elements as a GF, the F invariant part of G, uh, has um, uh, has uh, uh, has dimension, and uh, moreover, um, the conformal weight, the L naught eigenvalue, is determined by the uh, lowest weight only. And even better, um, the corresponding fields are these fields I alpha quantum corrected. Okay, and then um, and then and, and the next part of the theorem is that the homology is non-trivial except in degree zero. And, uh, and I, I I forgot to say the the complex has a natural z grading with respect to that z grading. Okay, so the 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 proof is standard and uh, it would take too long to present it. But um, what one uh, does is the following. One takes this complex and one somehow divides it into a positively graded and negatively graded part. And, uh, but one does it in such a way that each part is itself a whole vertex subalgebra and invariant under D naught. So this means um, we have here this uh, tensor product of sub complexes. And, uh, the interesting thing is that it's extremely easy to observe that the homology of the C complex C plus is trivial as one dimensional. So this means actually the homology one needs to compute is the one of the, of the subcomplex C minus. So one has, some, has simplified the problem already um, quite a bit. And now what one does is one uh, um, passes to a filtration and uh, such that uh, um, uh, the, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to compute the homology on the, on the associated graded. And uh, one then immediately gets that the homology of the associated graded is actually the affine vertex algebra um, uh, corresponding to the, uh, to GF, to the. And, uh, and, and all, all higher co uh, homologies uh, vanish. And, and then it, it turns out uh, because the higher differentials, they uh, change a degree by minus one, uh, the, 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 uh, the speckle sequence converges to this homology. So one, uh, yeah, one, one does a speckle sequence argument. Now, this proof uh, has a kind of nice um, properties. Um, one thing is um, uh, that, uh, both the Virasso mode and also the zero modes of this affine subalgebra of type A, they com commute with the differential. Um, and with both differentials. And so actually this isomorphism that the W algebra is isomorphic to this vertex algebra of type GF is not only as a vector space, but actually as a graded vector space by conformal weight and actually also as, uh, as an A module. And then uh, what is more important is um, uh, this, um, this proof also gives us a, a statement that's called formality. Namely, um, the W algebra can be identified with a subalgebra of the complex. 
So it's, it's a certain uh, sub algebra of uh, uh, elements in the kernel of D naught of a charge zero. Okay, this, and why is this important? Because what's the complex? It's an affine vertex algebra times a free field algebra. We know very well how it behaves. So then we can, uh, of course, deduce how a subalgebra behaves. And since um, well, a homology a priori is not a subalgebra, it's something quite more complicated. But, uh, but this formality property tells us we can view it as a subalgebra. Okay, let me give you uh, two examples. The very first one. Um, so first, uh, firstly, uh, in examples, it's usually easiest to do type A, SLN, the most familiar one. So um, we take um, G to be SLN and F principal nil potent. So how do we think about this? Um, well, we know the standard representation of SLN is C to the N, it's n-dimensional. And now we take an embedding of SL2 in G such that the standard representation becomes the irreducible n-dimensional representations of SL2. That, that's a way how to characterize the principal nil potent element. Now, um, you can write down what F is then explicitly and also can find um, um, uh, E and H, so, uh, and, uh, so uh, and, and, and then determine what G is as an SL2 module. So for example, F is, uh, is, is an, if you think about it as traceless N by N matrices, is a matrix that has only, only non-zero entries in the, in the uh, diagonal be below the, right below the main diagonal. In any case, it turns then out that SLN decomposes into the adjoint representation plus five dimensional representation plus seven dimensional representation and so on up to um, the two N minus up, the, up to the two N minus one dimensional representation. And then the, the theorem tells us that uh, for each, the the, the, the theorem tells us for each irreducible representation here, for each uh, irreducible representation here has of course one, only one lowest weight vector. And for each such lowest weight vector, we get a field of the W algebra. And the, con uh, and, um, and the conformal weight, the L0 eigenvalue of this element is R plus one. So this means in, in the SLN case, we get a, one generator of conformal weight two corresponding to the adjoint representation, one of conformal weight three corresponding to the five dimensional representation and so on uh, up to one element of conformal weight N. The conformal weight two element of course is always the so element. Okay, let's go to a more sophisticated example. I take now uh, G to be SLN slash M. So how do you think about SLN slash M? You think about it as N slash M times S N slash M super matrices. So this means uh, these are matrices of size N plus M times N plus M, where the diagonal N times N and M times M blocks are even and the off diagonal blocks are odd, and fermionic. And the super trace is the trace of the, on the upper block minus the trace on the lower one. And then the, uh, it turns out um, um, the, the, the super traceless matrices, they form a least super algebra that is the yes, super algebra SLN slash M. So this means the even part of it is just uh, um, uh, SLN plus SLM plus uh, G1. And uh, the odd part is uh, uh, the, these blocks, uh, they are of size n times m, the upper block and the lower block has the same size and they carry the tensor product of the standard representation respectively conjugate of these two. So now I, the, the principal nil potent element would be the one where I take F to be both principal in the upper and lower block. But now I decide to take something that uh, we like to call small hook type. So this, uh, I, I'd say in a moment why we call it like this. Uh, so we only, uh, we take F to be principal in one of these two blocks, say in the upper N by N block and trivial in the lower one. So that then, uh, 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 so, so, so that then, uh, 
and it, so that then the even a sub algebra, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, this is forward. So. That the even sub algebra decomposes here as the um, as the direct sum as all these irreducible SL2 representations times many copies of the trivial representation of uh, GLM plus uh, trivial of SL2 times GLN, and the odd part uh, decomposes as uh, the um, n-dimensional representation of SLN uh, uh, of SL2. Uh, times the sum of standard and conjugate of standard of GLM. So this is um, an easy exercise. You just write down the matrices. You write down what the SL2 in your upper block looks explicitly like. You decompose. But now this uh, theorem by Katzenbrock Akimoto tells us immediately R to every lowest weight vector of the SL2. We have a, a strong generator. And uh, the, the, the strong, its conformal weight depends on the, on the lowest weight. So this means these ones give us to, gives rise to uh, um, generators of type two, three up to N. These ones, here we have many copies of the trivial representation, namely M squared copies. And these give rise to an f and subalgebra of type GLM. And these are all even. And then here we have the N-dimensional representation of SLN that comes with multiplicity standard and conjugate of standard of GLM. So and that means that one has actually uh, odd generators of conformal weight n plus one over two and uh, two m such generators, and they generate the standard and conjugate of standard and under the affine GLM action. Okay. And then there are many more complicated examples. So this uh, example is called small hook because it, especially in type A, one can um, parameterize the new potent elements by partitions of the integer of its SLN slash M by partitions of the pair of integers N comma M. And these partitions are nicely illustrated in terms of young tableaus. And, um, and this example corresponds to what we call a small book type young tableau because it's a one column, one row. Okay, now I want to explain to you how to get more nice structural results. And uh, in order to do so, we need to understand how to pass uh, to a quasi-classical limit. This means we would like to take k to infinity. Well, for affine vertex algebras, we could do this super easily, right? You saw this took me one slide to, uh, or two slides to explain it to you because we have a very explicit formula of the operator product algebra of these strong generators. This, this makes our life nice and easy. For the W algebras, only in the very simplest cases, uh, uh, operator product algebras are known. So this means if we want to uh, understand quasi-classical limits, we need, um, we, need, we need a good idea. Okay, and um, um, so uh, in the literature, the most um, popular classical limit is the commutative case. And uh, there's the study of those goes back to Alberto de Sol, Victor Katz, also Daniel Valeri did quite a few things on this and also and many others. Um, so they int uh, int defined uh, what they call a family of Lie conformal super algebras, and they always use a lambda bracket, so I use it here as well. So this uh, means the remember the lambda bracket is uh, just an, uh, a nice way of encoding information of OPE algebra, and um, they call um, a vertex algebra over the polynomial ring in a variable epsilon to be uh, a family if in the lambda bracket. Um, um, every every element appears at least with a multiplicity. Uh, I mean, the, the polynomials with which um, uh, any element appears don't have any constant term in epsilon. They are always of the type epsilon time uh, plus higher degree terms in uh, epsilon. 
And uh, then they also use this notion of regularity. Well, you see, if you have such a regular family, what can you do is you can uh, take the limit epsilon to zero, which uh, or equivalent you, you take, uh, take the quotient by epsilon times v. And uh, so they call this v classical, this classical limit. And um, in that case, um, we, uh, then the, the right-hand side of the lambda bracket uh, disappears, equivalently the right-hand side of the OPE algebra disappears. In other words, uh, this uh, these classical algebra becomes nothing but a commutative that is super algebra. Um, so that's not exciting, right? But um, you know, what makes it is exciting is that uh, one can uh, define a Poisson bracket or a Poisson vertex bracket in this way. Right? So the, um, I mean, the, the, the lambda bracket or the OPE um, of um, uh, two fields is always uh, 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 a combination, linear combination of elements, uh, but they all uh, appear with epsilon plus higher degree terms of epsilon. And so now the Poisson bracket is just to be defined to be the lean, leading term of this uh, lambda bracket, respectively OPE. So this gives a uh, rise to a Poisson works algebra structure. This is more a side remark why uh, uh, Alberto de Sol and Dr. Katz and also many others study it. Um, what we want to uh, do is we want to now understand that, well, if you can do a classical limit, then you can also do a free field limit. So what do we do? Uh, we, we do, so we, we think about it in analogy to what did we did with OSP12. Um, so we have here this epsilon and now I, um, I would like to take a root of epsilon. So I define a sigma to be this root. Now I rescale the fields by uh, sigma inverse. Now, why do I do this? Because, um, um, uh, well, in the very first place, uh, I, I then just define V three to be uh, the limit sigma to infinity. So this means here. Thank you. And, um, why do we do this? Well, the, the cuts the soul limit is a commutative one because here now we, we uh, divide by sigma, uh, we, we ha can have constant terms. But which terms can appear with a constant if you think about it? Well, actually only, um, only the, the vacuum can appear with, with a non-zero constant. I mean, I mean with, a, uh, with a constant that does not vanish in the sigma to zero limit. So let me maybe go back to the OSP example that we appreciate what we did here. So here, this is the cuts the soul limit. Um, I rescale fields and, uh, I, uh, and, and you see with this rescaling, the OPE of these uh, fields um, that the OPE coefficients are polynomials and an epsilon, and these polynomials do not have a constant term. So this means you can especially define the classical limit by setting epsilon to zero, but however, the whole vertex algebra just become, becomes commutative. Now I, uh, I do this a, a little bit less drastically. I rescale by one over square root of K, which you can, can also think about it as, um, uh, rescaling the, the cuts the soul uh, scaling by uh, what I call one over sigma. And anyway, uh, the, the effect is that now, um, now I should have called this uh, sigma if, if I want to make contact with a new notation. In uh, any case, uh, the effect of this rescaling is that I still have um, many terms that uh, don't have a constant terms. That means they vin vanish in the epsilon to zero uh, limit. But the, 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 the terms that appear, come with a multiplicity uh, with, with a vacuum, they survive the limit. In, in this case, all of those survive it. 
and in general, some of those will survive it. Very good, let's go to um, uh, back. So this means our definition here is the, the generalization of um, what I presented for OSP 1.2. And uh, in, indeed, uh, the, I mean, it's defined exactly in such a way that um, this limit is a free field algebra strongly generated by the same strong generators as before. And uh, the lambda bracket is just given, it, it not, nothing has, it, it doesn't, doesn't have anything but, um, um, but, but, as, but a second order, uh, I mean, not a second order pool. I, I forgot here a lambda term. Uh, but any, anyway, on, on, only uh, the, the lambda bracket is uh, defined completely in terms of the, of the bilinear form of X and Y. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, this form can be non-degenerate. Um, but um, it is, uh, I mean, it can be degenerate, but it is non-degenerate, if and only if already this Poisson vertex super algebra had a non-degenerate pairing. So this is very interesting because uh, for us, because uh, um, people already have studied this Poisson limit in, in huge detail. So this means uh, one can hopefully um, uh, use that limit to also deduce quite a, a bit of structure about the free field limit. And so especially from the work of uh, the soul cuts and others, um, uh, it's, uh, it's immediate uh, to deduce that this uh, non-degenerate pairing is, uh, and this, this pairing is non-degenerate in, in many interesting cases. Okay, here now I, I, I um, restate the example of f and vertex super algebras. It's essentially the same as the OSP 1, 2 example just now phrased in the lambda bracket. So here you see this, the, the, the cuts the soul limit, lambda bracket goes with epsilon times something. So if epsilon goes to zero, it just becomes commutative. Um, and um, and the different limit, the one, the free field limit is, uh, uh, is, is, is this one. And in this case, uh, and, 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 and in this, this case, uh, um, the lambda bracket here has a, a, a term that just depends on the bilinear form and is independent of sigma, and then a linear term of sigma. So that means that in, in the, sigma to zero limit in the classical limit, we just get a free field algebra. Something similar you can do for already a free field algebra, but this is kind of a trivial op of operation because it's already a free field algebra. Uh, so we don't have to waste our time on this here. I just note this because um, if I can do this on a fn vertex algebra and on a free field algebra, then I can do this on the complex for the reduction to the W algebra. Okay, but this is now becomes um, uh, a little bit tedious. So what do we do now? Um, first of all, um, we, we have to be very careful now. Um, we change our perspective. We don't work over the, the over vertex algebras, uh, over the complex numbers, but uh, vertex algebras over the polynomial ring in the variables epsilon and epsilon inverse. Uh, because we already need our new potent element to be uh, of, of this form, one over epsilon times f, then e accordingly. Um, so, and uh, then, uh, well, this is a new potent element in, um, in uh, our Lie algebra over this commutative ring. And so we can, uh, look at the corresponding complex and it's a complex I, I really all I do here I replace the complex number by this commutative ring and what we prove is uh, that then there exists a regular family of complexes so this is um, 
Um, this is not a big deal. You have to be a little bit careful to see how the differential, um, the original differ differential needs to be rescaled to become a differential of this complex. But moreover, after base change, so this means uh, uh, um, the, right, the, 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 the regular family is only a vertex algebra of the, over the polynomial ring in epsilon. And after base change, this uh, becomes just, uh, this field super algebra just becomes the, uh, the, the complex that you use for the reduction corresponding to this, to the, to this new potent element. Um, yeah, so, so this is uh, what, what we prove and um, it's a, uh, It's it's really uh, repeating the old arguments um, uh, carefully uh, to, to to see how you have to absorb the scaling and then actually you discover how you need to define f, x and e in order for things to work. So, as you see now, the the advantage is now we have a regular family of uh, complexes, right? So this means uh, where we know from cuts and the soul that we can take the large level limit to get a commutative VOA. And this regular family after base change just becomes the complex um, over our uh, polynomial rank in epsilon, epsilon minus one. So this means we can define um, our W of epsilon to be the homology of this regular family. So this is simply, um, a change of perspective. While well, before we have defined W algebras to be um, vertex algebras over the complex numbers, and we have looked at uh, level for level, k for k. We, we now, instead of this one, well, k, we still fix uh, k, but now we take a vertex algebra over uh, polynomials in epsilon and actually a homology of vertex algebras over polynomials in. Uh, uh, in epsilon. Now the main point is that this one is a regular family of vertex super algebras. And this is why this formality is so important. This is why this proof um, uh, this of the structural uh, theorem of W algebras of Katz and Wakimoto is so important. This uh, W algebra is not only uh, the homology of this complex, but it's actually this uh, homology of this positive part of the complex and actually can be identified with a sub algebra. But the subalgebra of a regular family is a regular family itself. And moreover, uh, very much like uh, how the regular family, the complex for the regular family behaves under base change, also the, the homology, the W algebra uh, after base change can be identified with the W algebra at level K over epsilon. And uh, so especially then if I specialize epsilon as, as long as here a is non-zero, I just get the original W algebra as at a certain rescaled level back. So th this is a perspective that uh, is, is very instructive. And instead of thinking about vertex algebras over the complex numbers, you, you trade them and think about them as vertex, you trade the uh, complex numbers for nice large commutative ring this might be polynomials in one variables or polynomials also in epsilon inverse or, uh, or maybe just a, a certain localization of the polynomial rank in one variable. Or maybe at, actually at some point you might even include more than one variable. Good. Um, now, remember that um, the, the strong generators of the W algebra can be identified with GF, the, the kernel of F of G. And uh, you can uh, define a, a bilinear form on GF simply in, in this way. What you do is you take two lowest weight vectors A and B, you, uh, you apply um, this must be E. 
you, you apply um, E as often as you need in order to map B at the lowest weight vector to a highest weight vector. And uh, then the and then you can use your original pairing on the least super algebra and it might be non-zero. It actually def it, 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 it defines your pairing on this F invariant part. And it actually turns out for, for these W algebras, it defines a non-degenerate invariant pairing. And it's precisely the invariant pairing that the free field limits limit of this W algebra becomes. So this is um, uh, uh, super nice, right? Because uh, so very much like the affine product super algebras, also the um, uh, W super uh, W algebras, they allow for a large level limit. And, and in this large level limit, while we have no idea how to control the operator product algebra of the W algebra fields, in this limit, we, we, we can see that only the, 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 the constant, I mean, the uh, uh, only the bilinear form survives, but even better, we can completely determine it. It's completely given by uh, by by the natural pairing on the on the lowest weight vectors. Okay, so uh, why do we do this? Uh, when the very first place, uh, the free field algebra is simple if and only if the pairing is non-degenerate. And it's very easy to determine whether the pairing is non-degenerate or not. And moreover, um, uh, this uh, we, we can even also completely determine what this free field limit is. Maybe it's a, a standard, uh, it's, it's a tangible product of the free field algebra that I introduced and which one appear depend uh, depend only on, I mean, every lowest weight vector for the for SL2 gives rise to an, a strong generator of the free field algebra and what type it is depends only on the, on the weight on the, uh, of this lowest weight vector. So it's uh, completely determined by um, very simple data. Okay. Uh, now, um, Probably not many people are interested in these free field limits. And as such, neither are we. Why are we interested in these free field limits? Um, so what do we do is we, we have this W algebra, this vertex algebra. It's a vertex algebra of our polynomials in a formal variable or rational functions in a formal variable or maybe some localization of polynomials in a uh, variable. Um, and uh, and we don't know how it behaves, but we we can very controlled go uh, take a limit, and we can precisely determine how it behaves in that limit. Now it turns out that this is good enough to uh, to say how the W algebra behaves generically. Right. So we you I mean this W algebra is for every complex level k, it is something. And it, it might be a simple vertex algebra, it might have non-trivial ideals, who knows? But for example, um, if it has non-trivial ideals, it can have them only at isolated points. It can have at most countable many, uh, there can be at most countably many levels for which this W algebra is not simple. Um, so that, that's already good because uh, actually in order to, uh, to prove, uh, already to prove that the W algebra is generic simple, um, I think wasn't known bef before our work. Uh, for W algebras it was known, but not for super algebras. Anyway, simplicity was not the main, main point of, of course. There are much, much more deeper consequences because now I told you these W algebras, they have affine sub algebras. And um, so then you, you can ask a, a question that is extremely interesting is what is the subalgebra that commutes with the action of an FN subalgebra? This is called coset algebra. Or these uh, W algebras, they have certain groups acting via automorphisms. And you can ask what is the subalgebra um, invariant under this group action? And while these questions are extremely hard to answer in, in general, 
um, much more structure can be inferred in, uh, on, uh, in this free, free, free field limit and then kind of quantum deformed uh, to, to, the, to a generic level limit. So I'm, I'm done for uh, today and Andy will continue and he, he will roughly pick up here. So um, uh, he will now use these uh, free field limits to explain to how get to get actually quite deep results about W algebras. And then on Wednesday, I want to go on and um, state a few theorems I think are important and explain why I think they are important, uh, how to think about those. And, um, and I hope I, I will also have time to connect a little bit to Victor Ostrich or do Pace talks, but I don't know yet whether that will work. In any case, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so let's thank the speaker uh, <laughs> in a personal way. Uh, uh, okay, uh, are there any questions? Uh, I have first some sort of technical question. Can you send slides to the chat or maybe? Can I do what? Send your slides to the chat. Yes, uh, um, I, I can do this, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I, I, um, yeah I, I will do this now. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, if anybody has a question, please ask. It will uh, take me maybe a minute to, to find my question. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so um, you explained about this classical or quasi-classical limit. So you explained what's happening with the vertex separated algebras. I wonder if there is something you can do with the representations with modules of these algebras to get the modules over the algebras you obtain in the classical or quasi-classical limit? Yeah, good question. Um, yes. uh, I, I just uh, quickly upload. Um, Yeah, I have, I have problems uploading this to the to the chat. Um, um, Maybe you can do this later. Yeah, or maybe just, I just, 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 just sending your slide by yeah, email. Maybe, me. Yeah, that's maybe better. I'll send you the slides and then uh -huh, you can uh -huh. either put it on the homepage or distribute it. Okay, that, that's probably better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Evgeny, um, your question is really good. And um, Andy and I, we already meant, always meant um, to look at uh, this. It's, um, um, so uh, so you, you can, of course, um, uh, study a representation theory of the free field algebra. And this is something not difficult at all to do. Um, but it becomes um, more interesting if you study the uh, orbifold of this free field algebra or uh, something that Andy will explain. And, uh, and then you can ask how these, uh, do these models deform. Um, and we, we didn't study it, but what will happen is, is that um, the, uh, uh, this deformation will only give a certain class of modules for the, for the deformable family. You, you, you will not get a perfect information. Um, so I, uh, 
ya um, but but your question is uh, very interesting because um, um, so I, I explained these limits and also these mixed limits for um, also for one reason, uh, another reason, they are very interesting. Also these mixed limits appear and they appear in more sophisticated cases, namely deformations of larger structures that are not affine VOAs. And for example, these, these triplet algebras that are very famous in logarithmic CFT, these are, um, these are not uh, W algebras, but large extensions of W algebras at very, very special levels. And these extensions are such that these vertex algebras, first of all, carry a compact Lie group as auto automorphism groups. Moreover, their representation of theory is at least uh, conjecturally um, a, a finite but non semi simple modular tensor category. So that's something Victor will talk about. And, and, and these algebras have been introduced by um, Boris and Tipunen. And uh, what turns out is at least physics suggests that these algebras can be realized as um, large level limits of, of um, vertex algebras that appear in four dimensional physics. And, um, and uh, but, but these deformable families should have a really, really interesting representation theory that is kind of much more uh, even much more interesting than these triplets. And we don't, yeah. Okay, anyway, Evgeny, I'm sorry. I, I don't have too much to say about your question. It's, it's a very good problem. It's something somebody, one should do. What should do is ex especially because it applies also to even in more interesting problems, but it hasn't been done yet. Thank you. Other questions? I have another mathematical question, uh, just for, me, uh, for understanding. Sometimes when people define W algebra, they at least, for, for example, finite W algebra, they start from some isotropic subspace in G one half, minus one half, I think, in the notation. Uh, instead of this, uh, you added some additional um, uh, fermions, which correspond to one half. So what should I think? This correspond to zero sub isotropic subspace or what? Um, Does my question make sense? Right. Uh, um, so, for example, um, sometimes people take Lagrangian subspace in uh, Yeah. Half. Exactly. Yeah, this is um, this is how uh, W algebras are in, uh, introduced in the finite setting, right? Um, so, so the um, yeah, uh, what 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 do we do? Uh, so we, I mean, really, uh, this uh, choosing this uh, new important element. What it does is it gives you a decomposing decomposition of your the super algebra into I mean, it gives it a Z grading, especially there we have positive part. And uh, now um, what does this quantum Hamiltonian reduction, uh, reduction do? Well, it, it wants to kind of set this um, positive part, which I think is your isotropic subspace to zero, except, uh, except uh, the element that corresponds to E, I mean, the, the E of the SL2 triple, it wants it, it to set it to a constant. And, um, this is what, what morally speaking this differential does. As I said, it's kind of, um, I mean, it, all these um, constructions that are, they are inspired from physics and what the physicists want to do, they wanted to gauge away the positive part of the, of the affine vertex algebra. I mean, except setting this E to a constant and how can you realize this gauge fixing procedure always as a as some kind of semi infinite cohomology and i think this is how actually the quantum hamiltonian reduction developed by trying to formalize this i uh, but but I, uh, I i don't know um um so for, for me, it's definitely the best way to think about W algebras, by the way, I, I introduced it as this cohomology and not 
we are certain isotropic subspaces or setting anything but to zero. Can we just add that, I mean, take Lagrangian some space and uh, define correspondent algebra to so this Lagrangian space plus some of the uh, negative uh, G, some uh, G, G minus one, G minus three over two, and so on. This is an important algebra and takes a meaningful homology of the, by this, of this algebra. Yeah, you, you can do this, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and what we do is, is, is a, a semi infinite cohomology with a character of that type, with an additional character. Yes, of course. Uh, um, yes, of course, with the character. So it will be the same or, or not? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's such, such a cohomology with a character. But it will be different co complex if you take just some infinite cohomology with this for this subalgebra with Lagrangian some space. Well, it, it is a semi infinite cohomology with a character. I, 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 I feel I don't quite understand. I'm sorry. I, I feel I can't answer your question. Okay, maybe I can't ask. Properly. Uh, Thomas? Ah, Simon, hi. hi. Um, so, so in this katzbach Kimoto theorem, you had this uh, restriction which said that certain eigenvalues are, uh, are not positive. So this seemed to me at first sight, I, I didn't know that, but it seemed to me like a restriction on, on the Lie algebra and the nilpotent element or so, so, so what are, are there counterexamples for that? And does it behave very differently or is it just a technical restriction or? Yeah, um, I haven't thought about it. I'm not, I, I don't know of a counterexample. I mean, it, I, I never came across a, a, a counterexample. Um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, um, I, uh, but, but, um, yeah, so I, I, I uh, um, so, so it, it's it, it just means in, there's no interesting case where this is relevant. It, in a, the the it, it, well, I mean the lowest yeah. I mean you, you can see this can only happen really if you have uh, infinite dimensional modules. So this means if you do, uh, do such type of reduction for infinite dimensional the algebra, which we don't really want to do. Okay. I, uh, so and if and if I may, so how can I imagine this A you introduced? So so is that a semi-simple thing, or can this be anything? And it's, 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 it's a trivial it's, for principal F, or is that random? Can I mean how, how does this depend yeah, on F? Yeah, um, so th this depends on. Uh, so roughly doing what what, what you do is uh, always the following: you you uh, let me you take a G Lie algebra, and you you fix your SL two sub algebra. And uh, then uh, you um, and, and and so then uh, you you uh, and then you always have uh, the subalgebra A um, uh, in uh, in G that comm commutes with with the SLL SL two. And um, depending on how you choose your F, A might be trivial or um, it might be non-trivial. Then whenever you start with a semi-simple D super algebra, um, then A will always be a reductive uh, Li sub algebra, Li sub super algebra. So, and, uh, and uh, the, the best thing to learn about it is uh, to do uh, um, examples, but um, 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 yeah, for, for example, if you take uh, SLN plus M, I, what can you do? You can write down a big matrix and you can, for example, uh, take a big upper block, take an important element that is principal in this big upper block. Then you immediately see that this lower lower block compute, commutes with this SL2 action. And this then gives you your GLM subalgebra that survives the reduction. But um, yeah, and anyway, this A, it depends highly on, on F. And if the principal, uh, uh, if the nilpotent element is large, for example, principal nilpotent, then A is trivial. Well, except for for these super algebra cases, and um, and then there are also sometimes, for example, type E six, seven, eight have subregular nilpotent elements for which there's also 
uh, a for which a is also trivial. Great, thanks. But this A always gives you a lot of structure, right? So that's that's good. It's good to know it. And uh, we are interested in the cases where A is non-trivial, or mostly interested in those cases. Okay. Other questions? Uh... So if, if not, uh, we thank the speaker again and uh, we'll resume in uh, half an hour at 8.30 Moscow time. <laughs> Late for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, not really. Oh. Okay. So now we have a half an hour break. Thank you very much. <laughs>